I'm going to be joined by an absolutely stellar panel of leaders from the UK automotive industry. Can I invite the panel to join me on stage while we watch a short video? Thank you. Our automotive industry has made great strides towards zero emission vehicles. I think we need to think about this as a revolution that needs to bring everyone along and not leave anyone behind. And by that I mean that we need to ensure equal opportunities for all customers. To do that, we need a joined up plan to ensure the infrastructure is in place ahead of the demand curve. Government must invest in the rollout of a charging infrastructure that keeps pace with the take up of EVs and gives all car owners the confidence they need. As a company, we will continue to work with a range of stakeholders to help further develop the market for greater zero emissions transport. This includes realising the full potential for hydrogen fuel cell technology. The biggest challenge in the transition remains mass adoption. The public still needs to be fully convinced there is charging availability and reliability nationwide. Thank you. So I'm going to start um, going round the panel with a, a broad uh, set of views, please, on what is the current state of the market and consumer demand from EVs from each of your perspectives. Lisa, can I start with you? Okay, so I'm going to answer it in two ways. First, for passenger cars. So I think um, we're well underway, I think, with passenger cars. About 11% of the UK industry last year was battery electric vehicles. It's hard to know where, what the real number is because of all the supply constraints, but we're often started with this choice in the market. Um, so I, th I think that's great. On commercial vehicles, I think it's a different story. So only about... 4%, just under 4% of the market was battery electric vehicles last year. But some of that's down to choice and availability, but a lot of it's down to the fact that it's a much more challenging use case for customers to make battery electric vehicles work for them because of the practicalities. We're launching um, Big Transit, a battery electric transit vehicle this year. We've had a lot of interest, but customers are going slowly, and a lot of the interest is from fleet customers rather than from retail customers, and that's primarily because of the, the cost issues around it. So I think it's two different stories for both parts of the market. Okay, fascinating. Thank you. Um, Paul, could I turn to you? Sure. Um, I, was, I guess I was a bit nervous this morning when I heard a representative from government talking about approaching a tipping point. We're beyond a tipping point already. Um, to put that into context, the scale of customer interest in electrified vehicles right now is immense. It's doubled versus the same period of time last year. Um, just to give you two numbers, in 2019, as a manufacturer, we sold 700 EVs in the UK car market. It was less than 1% of everything we sold. Last year, we sold over 14,000 which was about 15% of what we sold. This year, in the first quarter, order take, all the orders we've taken in quarter one, and there's a lot, over 20% of them are for pure EVs. We are way beyond a tipping point, and it's only going to increase further as more EVs come to market. We've got three today on offer. In five years' time, we've probably got seven different car lines that are fully electrified. Um, this is a trend that's coming at us rapidly, and we can't shy away from the fact and say we're approaching a tipping point. We're beyond a tipping point. It's immense, immense growth. Uh, Alison, can I turn to you? And I, I endorse what uh, colleagues have said. So I think the market is there. So we'll see if you look at the general market, it's flat year on year, but the mix within it is really strongly towards low emission vehicles. And there's a whole combination of them, which we'll get on to talk about in terms of what suits. Mm -hmm. That's in terms of the way the manufacturers have bought those vehicles to market, and that is in cars and vans. We see a really strong demand in vans as well as Lisa has said. So you see it, so you've got the products coming to market, which is speeding up the take up of it. Mm -hmm. um, but what you need, and we'll get onto it, is the affordability and ease of use. And I think that's a key part that we've been talking about and we'll continue to talk about. Phenomenal. And Stuart? I think just to pick up on the, the, the points around affordability and, and, and ease of use, you know, as we've heard this morning, significant uplift in, in interest, in demand, and we've seen over the last couple of years that, that, you know, and I say alternative fuel vehicles, electrified vehicles in the broader sense, have, have increased significantly. But we haven't got a passenger car, purely electric vehicle, on the market yet. So we launched that for the first time this summer. But for us, we already have in our passenger car range almost 90% of electrified vehicles. And we'll come on to talk about that a little bit, little bit later on in terms of what is that right transition to pure EV or 
cleaner transportation um, because for, for us it's a, it's a real mix of, of solutions that, that is going to lead to you know, access for, for all in terms of that greener mobility. But, but yeah, we've, uh, we've seen a significant interest and increase in demand, but I think the concerns and the consumer uh, demands around usage and customer experience uh, are really sort of uh, uh, coming, coming to the fore now, which I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about in a moment. Mm -hmm. Well, let's pick up on that now, I guess. It's, um, I think the affordability question and the consumer experience question are kind of key, and we've heard some of that already this morning. Um, maybe I can ask you each to comment on that specifically. How, how are you seeing that challenge, and how are you looking to tackle it? Maybe I can turn to you. So we have a range of, of vehicles and they've come to market, so it is about affordability. So I think you see a desire of people wanting to switch to either electric or plug-in hybrid. Plug-in hybrid works and we see for customers who are concerned about how I'm going to live with my vehicle. And it means that you can see people go into a plug-in hybrid because they've got that reassurance of a, a nice engine behind them. And then you see that they then move from plug-in hybrid into electric. So it's a good bridge to learn how to live with all the things we've seen um, spoken about this morning, you know, in terms of charging, how can I do it? Um, and then it needs to be affordable as well. So we've got vehicles coming out. So the new Fiat 500e has come out, which is really affordable for, co um, for customers. But then you have to think, so how easy is it for me as a customer and how affordable? So we've got that. I think as manufacturers, we have the technology. We've spoken about the need for infrastructure, either at home or if you're in rented accommodation or if you're in a block of flats, because that's what will happen on a Sunday night when you get home. You know, you're late, you've been to see family, you've got the kids in the back, it's pouring with rain, you're low on charge, and you've got to drive to work the following morning. If we can crack that as a combination of government infrastructure providers and manufacturers, then we have an easier solution for customers. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal. Lisa, could I turn to you? I, I agree with Alison. I think we've seen that we have a Cougar plug-in hybrid in the market and we've seen customers buying that as a way in. It's a no-risk way to electrify because if you run out of charge, you've got an, an engine to drive. And because those vehicles are connected, we can see how they're being used. And actually, for most people, on most days, they're running it on battery because of the way their journeys are, are structured. So it's a really easy entry point. And you know, for round efficiency, we've got a range of mild hybrid engines that are there in the marketplace. I think as we move forward, we, we announced last week that we were bringing a range of smaller battery electric vehicles, three more vehicles into the market in the next couple of years. And that will help with the affordability issue. But notwithstanding that, as you move from mild hybrid plug-in hybrid into proper battery electric vehicles, you do need the charging infrastructure. And I think we've got, we are seeing with Mustang Mach-E, which is a more premium product, the people that are buying it are elect electrified enthusiasts or early adopters. They're prepared for a bit of um, inconvenience and kind of are, are wanting to try it out. We need to overcome some of the concerns for it to take the jump from that, that niche into more mass market and for everyone to buy. And I think until we crack that and people have more confidence, and I think the confidence needs to come with infrastructure that's ahead of the curve, not chasing behind that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Understood. Um, would that chime with your experience, Paul? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, affordability now for many people is a lot less of an issue than it was a couple of years ago. And part of that is because we're now seeing the used car market for electric vehicles develop quite quickly. Uh, in the last three years, residual value for a used Kia EV has gone up 40%. That's squatting the monthly payment, making it much more competitive with a petrol or diesel car and much more affordable for many more people. I think the other thing about affordability is over the last three years, we've seen government support through plug-in car grant go from very generous um, down to price threshold constrained. Um, now, I think there's only 20% of EVs on the market today that actually benefit from the plug-in car grant, and they're the ones with the lowest range, which is a bit of a dichotomy. But um, I, I think the, the point about plug-in car grant, none of our EVs today uh, attract a plug-in car grant at all, yet we've seen demand continue to increase. So I think that affordability issue for many is becoming a lot less. Of course, it is still an issue for some. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good to know. Um, and, and Stuart, how, how are you thinking about affordability and consumer experience issues? Well, I, I think, you know, as, as Paul says, the, the, the strength of, I mean, certainly our full hybrid range has been on the market for a significant period of time, and we've seen those vehicles go through second third cycle of ownership with residual values holding up extremely well 
and huge demand in the used car marketplace to the point that, that actually, you know, the, the, on certain vehicles, the prices are starting to, to compete with, with new car given some of the supply challenges. But I think as we move from, from full hybrid to plug-in hybrid to, to battery electric, I think it's around peace of mind as well because I think the, the, the purchase decision, the ownership cycles have been very much an ownership product. I think as we move into full battery electric, we need to give that peace of mind in terms of residual values in an emerging part of the market as the technology is strengthening and the products are strengthening. So I, I think we need to think of, of different solutions and different packages to go to market with, with full EVs to give a peace of mind as the market starts to emerge. And importantly, as, as the, the sort of early mainstream start to consider full EVs, and, and that's where our focus is at the moment. Great, fantastic. Um, and we've touched on it a couple of times already, just kind of moving on um, to a discussion around the used vehicle market. So there's been a lot of uh, focus on the switch from internal combustion engines in new vehicle purchase, driven by legislation, but what might that transition look like and where more might we need to focus in the used market? Would you like to comment on that, Lisa? Okay, so Paul kind of touched on it, is that in the UK, I think we all know that um, residual values are the foundation for new vehicle sales. Mm -hmm. And it's what is one of the key factors in affordability. A lot of people pretty much buy their car based on monthly payment. So supporting the residual values of internal combustion in engine as we go through the transition is really important. I don't mean supporting us in um, making payments, but I mean we, d we shouldn't be doing anything to destroy that residual value. So I think to manage the transition and to address that affordability issue, we need to be cautious about how we transition out of used internal combustion engines, because we call time on it too soon. We're going to undermine residual values and increase the cost of change. And the only way to address that, I think, is gov government subsidy. So I think we need to be cautious. I mean, obviously, we're seeing EVs now trickle into the used vehicle market. Um, so, so that's coming. The other thing I think is we need to recognise is not everybody buys a new car. We have a really large used vehicle industry every year. Sometimes that's down to choice, but occasionally, in many instances, down to affordability. And unless we want to have a have and a have not, we need to make sure that we can kind of protect that flow in a managed way and not call time on used internal combustion engines too soon. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Would anyone else like to comment on that theme? I think the, um, the management of the used vehicles is what Lisa has said, and, and I think it's also from a customer perspective. If you go into the used car market, it's what access you've got to information. So we know that many of our customers look online. There are concerns about, okay, well, how long will the battery last for? So it, it's those myths um, or confusion for customers that we need to be really clear as manufacturers about in terms of how easy it is, what certainty you have in terms of that vehicle when you buy it, and then keeping the residual values up. But I do agree with Lisa, it's about how you move the whole car park, because we've been talking very heavily about new um, and what the deadlines are for 2030. But there is a mass of customers who have either a, um, a current vehicle, either that car or a van, that has a value to it. And you don't want to destroy that value, otherwise it will make the transition harder, which is contradictory to what we're all trying to do. So it's, it's a watch out, mm -hmm. definitely. I think we've got a real opportunity in the next year. I think everyone knows how short the globe is of semiconductors. Um, there's double the number of semiconductors in every EV compared to a petrol or a diesel car. We're desperately short of EV supply. The used car market in the UK is almost a perfect economic model. Demand goes up, supply is short, guess what, prices go up. And that's giving everyone confidence about EVs as a second car, as something that um, is more affordable, because clearly it's had maybe two or three years usage, so the price is 20, 30, 40% less than a new car price. Um, that makes it accessible to more people, provided those people have confidence about their future usage and whether they can charge it in all the places they want to charge it. Mm -hmm. well, I hadn't thought of it that way, yeah, I kind of... Yeah, the shortage in driving demand in a, in a different sense. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to switch now um, to a slightly different perspective on consumer needs. So um, powertrain technologies and why a broad mix of powertrain technologies are important in meeting customer needs. Stuart, come on um, to you. Well, I think as, as Andy sort of put very well this morning, I think putting all our eggs in, in one basket, investing just in one technology isn't necessarily a, a quicker way to, to carbon neutrality. And we need to... We need to think about customer needs. We need to think about infrastructure maturity. We need to think about that journey that we're going on. So very much from a, from a Toyota's perspective, it's, it's very much around a, a multi-path journey to getting more people into electrified vehicles and low emission driving. 
and if we jump straight to pure battery electric too quickly, and indeed think about the, the, the regional variants as we saw earlier on um, in, in some of the slides, I think we, we, we run the risk of, of leaving too many people behind. And then, of course, we get onto the affordability, accessibility challenge. And certainly for us, mobility for all is, is, is central to, to our strategy. And that means introducing people to electrified products, cleaner products, at the right time for them and the market readiness. And, you know, we, we, we could be accused uh, of, 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 of maybe coming a little bit later to, uh, to, the, to the, the, the full battery electric party, as it were. But, but actually, it's about recognising the readiness of the consumer, the market, and what the right journey is to, to actually get our vehicle fleets down quicker but not leaving anyone behind. And, you know, I was ahead of this, I was chatting to a, a, a colleague in Norway uh, uh, only yesterday just to ask about where, where they are on their journey. And albeit, you know, sales this year, 80% alternative fuel um, and a significant increase in, uh, in adoption, actually it's very much centred around those urban environments. And even with the rest of the country, people are being left behind or access to the, to the infrastructure and, and the charging points is, is simply not there. So taking the internal combustion engine away too quickly, or indeed in a full hybrid sense, is going to leave an awful lot of, of people behind. And, and we recognise that I think there's different solutions for, for different transport needs. So if it is urban commuting, then of course, pure battery electric is, 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 a, great, is a great option. If it's longer range, full hybrid, plug-in hybrid is a, is a key transition point. And indeed, Hydrogen, you know, and, and larger vehicles, as we heard today, whether it be buses, trucks, um, you know, that has a part to play as well. So we're investing in, in multiple, multiple technologies to ensure that we, uh, we, we meet everyone's needs and bring everyone and that mainstream audience with us. I think I would fully endorse that, that hybrid and plug-in hybrid are critical to our transition to full EVs. Without it, the, the charging infrastructure will always be too far behind. And you know, I don't see it catching up fast enough. So we need hybrids, we need plug-in hybrids where you don't have to rely on getting somewhere and finding a charge point. And I think that's why um, this evolution from the combustion engine through to electrification has to go along this journey for many customers. Some can go to make the jump immediately to EVs, and many are. But others have to go through this transition from combustion engine to hybrid to plug-in hybrid and finally to EV once they have the confidence in charging. Yeah, and for a variety of reasons, as we've touched on. But yeah, um, would you like to? I think it's the power. I think it's the powertrain, like you said. Which powertrain or which source? So we have hydrogen. We're investing in four vans, because I think it's about knowing what the end game is. And then, as Andy, you'd endorse what he said in terms of the scientists, the engineers, find the, the solution to get there. And there are a variety of solutions depending on whether you're a a retail a customer, you know, and, and you're doing things for your private personal use or whether you're a business. So we've got a whole range um, in terms of, okay, do hy does hydrogen work for those heavier payloads? Does the Citroen AMI work for the last mile deliveries because we've got congestion charges and we haven't even covered what happens in cities where you've got, where you don't want vehicles at all, you want car sharing or you've got to deliver logistics into those cities. Um, and we've got solutions. So the industry does have solutions they're working on and to be too prescriptive I think you may lose an opportunity which endorses what Andy said earlier so I think uh, we have a lot of technological development and we need to find the way to get to it with government saying okay that's the end point um, but we'll let you work out the best way to get there and then support it through fiscal policies um, and through the nudges that they give to consumers. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Yeah I mean I, th I think uh, just to call out the commercial vigour bit of the industry so I think um, you know, we know the end game in 2023, that's really clear. Sorry, uh, 2033, that's really clear. But um, the transition will go at different paces for different bits of the, the industry. And for many commercial vehicle owners today, electrification isn't practical. It, we're working to make it practical, but it's going to be a journey and it might be a little bit slower and different by different segments. So I think it's important to keep that choice to basically keep Will keep Britain moving and delivering and, and, and working. <coughs> okay, great.
So I think you know, we've touched on some of this already and we've heard some views around where the main barriers to uptake are at the moment. So we heard a view that range anxiety is solved um, and we're now about charging anxiety. Um, I'm really interested in your personal views on that and where, whether you would agree with that, whether you see other barriers that are the next challenges to cross. Paul. I, I think there are three barriers, two of which we've talked about already. One is supply, two is affordability. We've talked about those. The third is literally confidence. Um, you know, if you've got a home charger and if you've got access to a charger at work for 90% of the usage of your cars, you're fine. You've got complete confidence of how, that my car's going to be charged and ready to go. But on those Mercy Missions five-hour drives up the motorways to visit a sick relative, you'll be worrying about where do I charge? Can I charge when I get there? When I get to a charging station, will someone be on it? Will it be working? Um, how long will I have to wait? Will this delay me getting to my end destination? I think that whole anxiety that Mike talked around, you know, charging anxiety is the new issue that we're all facing up to. Um, you know, we heard earlier that um, you know, it, it, the number of EVs on our roads today has gone up 600% in the last two years. The number of charge points, rapid charge points, has gone up 80%. It's not keeping pace. And um, you know, in Korea, they are... Um, investing ahead of the curve in terms of charging infrastructure. They have one rapid charger for every 12 EVs on their roads. So a lot of the time they're not used, but, but EVs can now develop rapidly because customers will have the confidence. Here I think the comparative number is one for every 32 EVs on the road. Now I'm quite worried about the other 31 others. If I'm driving up to a charge station, I don't know whether someone else will be on it. Mm -hmm. I, see, I see lots of nodding. Would you, um, would you agree with that, Lisa? Yeah, I mean, I think that there is, you know, if you think about customers, we've seen the people who are enthusiastic and passionate and want to try have, have, are there and are inquiring, but there's a vast range of customers who are cautious and, and are holding back from adopting for a whole host, whole host of reasons, and we collectively, every in the room, need to make it easy, worry-free and normal to have an electric vehicle. And I think the other thing we need to be kind of aware of is we saw the stats that Dr. Becker shared is there's a really big north-south north -south divide and there is actually a very big practical issue between people that live in different kinds of houses in different kinds of places and there is a risk of having you know a really divided economy or or marketplace out there and I think that collectively both um, government and us need to come up with plans to make that not the case because I think there, there will be a point where we will hit and we need to then make the jump to make it accessible and normal for everybody. And that's around taking away the people's concerns and just make it, as you say, a no-brainer decision and a normal decision that people have an EV. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a long way to go in terms of that yet. And do you, I mean, should we be investing ahead of need? Should, yeah, is that the role so. for government? I mean, I think that, you know, it's interesting when you talk to customers about the questions they ask and then you compare with what we can see. So I talked about having connected vehicles and what you see is most, people journey, most people's journeys, most days are very short. They don't have to charge every day. I mean, some people don't even have to charge every week. You know, they have enough range, but they're worried about the time that they don't do that. And it's kind of in many respects an irrational fear. And yes, they are concerned about the motorway journey and it's those practicalities. And as Alison said earlier, it will always happen on the dark night when it's wet and it's cold and you desperately have to get somewhere. And those are the problems we need to prove to people that aren't, aren't there anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you truly want to take the barrier away, you would invest the infrastructure ahead of need so that it doesn't become a barrier. So we've said we've said about it. So you need the technology which we have. You need the infrastructure which the energy companies work with government on, and then you need the customers to want to move. It's a habit. It's a habit for all of us. You know, we've filled our vehicles up with petrol or diesel for many many years. We have to get to a petrol station. We can't run out on the motorway. But it is that it's a <coughs> real psychological change. It's how we how we live our lives, and that's the more barriers you can take away in terms of affordability, in terms of. I will know I will find a, a charger or I've got an app where I can see all the chargers, which is the other point, making it really easy to plan my journey, the better chance we have. And you can see us compared to other countries, we're not at that position yet. So uh, we have the technology. We need the infrastructure to be there and we need government policies to support all of our customers, whether that's private, fleet, cars, vans, trucks, buses. It, it needs to be a holistic approach that's, that's really joined up. Mm. And we saw, I mean, we saw that gap widening, the kind of the proportion of charges per vehicle is widening hugely. Are we, uh, 
how easy is it going to be to close that gap? Is the time to act now? Do we need to really accelerate? Stuart? I, I, absolutely. I think everything we've heard this morning is very much about acceleration of, of infrastructure, both private and public investment. But I, I think, you know, this the, the comment that, that really struck according to this morning isn't that the innovators, the early, the early adopters, or indeed the early mainstream, it's the it's that last 30 to 40 percent that we really need to give confidence to and and they're starting to show a real level of interest we've got great products i think that's probably been a barrier in the past that the range uh, uh, of products there's some fantastic products i think the costs um, and the, the quality of those products is, is is coming down but it's taken us 10 15 years to get hybrid to a, a mainstream audience and sort of normalize it and that's taken a huge amount of, of effort and of course without the requirement for the infrastructure and the confidence to travel, um, and of course, you know, there, there's still a, a level of misunderstanding around hybrid and what that means. So it's it's quite a noisy marketplace, and therefore consumer understanding, confidence, supporting those consumer journeys and that experience is is, is going to be critical to to adoption. But I think there's another point that you know I, I fully endorse everything that's been said, but we also need to be thinking about hydrogen infrastructure as well. Now. At the moment, 700 bar um, at Fulling State you know, is less than 20. We recognise that passenger car, it's very early on. And we need to be thinking about um, you know, larger vehicles and, and clusters. But we need to be focusing on how do we start to, to, to work across industry and partner um, and, and generate the, the, the local demand for, for a, a solution like hydrogen to then start to, to, to roll out because, you know, yes, we've got a huge journey ahead in, in terms of charging infrastructure for EV, but, but what next? And, and, and what's that, that journey beyond? And, and that starts now in terms of some of those partnerships. Yeah, yeah. Should we touch on hydrogen for a moment there? Maybe let's uh, pick that up. Um, is there, is there, where do you sit, uh, Lisa, in terms of the hydrogen journey? Is that something for now? So that, I think for us, that's something for the future. I mean, we've committed as a, a company that we're 100% behind electrification. That's the focus. We are obviously working on hydrogen in the background, but I think in the short to medium term, our, our focus is around electrification. Mm -hmm. And we've said we were, we're running trials, so we're looking to see how, because on the heavier payloads, so the vehicles that need heavier payloads, you would need an enormous quantity of heavy batteries to be able to support that. So there are various solutions. So it's something that, that we're looking at and we've publicly said that we're supporting. But of course, then it does link to what Stuart said, about you then need to think ahead and think about that infrastructure as well to be able to support it. So where you're going from point to the back to the same point, so if you're taking a van out and you're doing work and coming back to a point, you can set up trials in depots where you can know that that vehicle can get back to that point. Um, and that's a way to test it to see how it can be used um, yeah, in the industry. Yeah, but you need confidence across the full mm -hmm. value chain in order exactly. to be able to take it out of the pilot. Uh, the city. Uh, I think hydrogen is definitely part of the future, um, but the infrastructure right now is almost non-existent. And as I understand it, conversion of petrol stations to hydrogen fuel stations is hugely expensive mm. and probably prohibitive. So at a time when we really need government investment on charging infrastructure for electric vehicles, I'm not sure that the mines will they'll get their minds round and hydrogen and, and, and. I think we really need to be single-minded on charging infrastructure in the next five to 10 years to support the um, rapid growth of electrification. Mm -hmm. Um, and perfect segue into um, kind of views of the right place for government to kind of place its attention right now, given all of the challenges that we've talked about. We heard a call for a regulator. We've heard lots of calls for infrastructure investment, whether that's generally or to close the, some of the geographic divides we've talked about. Really interested to hear your perspectives on where we should look first. Maybe we can stay with you, Paul. I, um, I think what we need is long-term thinking. We need joined-up thinking, and we need to recognise that the customer is at the centre of it. We've got to make charging an electric vehicle as easy as filling up with petrol or diesel. Um, and no one body can do that. I think it's got to be government-led, but it's got to incorporate us as OEMs. It's got to incorporate the electricity companies, the charge point providers, local authorities and governments um, to, to build up a long-term plan that gets us ahead of the curve of take-up of EVs. Um, you know, there's also danger that we invest in the wrong type of charges now in the wrong places. Because if in 10 years every EV could be, every new EV could be charged within 10 minutes on an ultra-fast charger, you need a different charging infrastructure than the one you're probably perceiving today. 
So that's why I think it needs this national plan. It needs a, cen a central body, a central forum uh, coordinating and uh, seeking views from all stakeholders to make sure this country can develop a world-class charging infrastructure. I'm not sure we're on that track right now. And, and as that is, it's about having a coordinated approach to it, because I know some people will say, well, the batteries are going to extend in range, therefore you don't need so many um, charges. No, but you'll have more vehicles on the road, therefore there's a counter to that. So um, the call for a regulatory body was say, OK, this is to set the targets and actually work towards the targets in terms of what we need for infrastructure. As we've said, the technology is there, the technology is being developed. Government plays a part in working across to make sure we have an infrastructure to take that barriers away. And then the policy, so the fiscal policies. So plugging car grant, whether it goes up or down and whether you agree with a cap on what should be, the, the message it sent after COP26 was actually that doesn't fit with, with the messaging of it. And that's where you come to the long-term plan, saying, yes, this is definitely where we're going to. This is where we need to be, and being consistent in it in terms of the taxation policies, the vehicle excise duty um, that we, we've got. And we're not having that at the moment. Sometimes what is said is different to then what happens in practice, and that's what can cause confusion, which then causes delay. It's like, well, I'll wait and see. And if we really need to get there with consumers, we need to keep pushing faster. I'm not sure what else there, there, there probably is to, to, to add at that point. I, I think certainly we share the government's determination for carbon neutrality and, and, and zero emission transport. I think there's, there's no doubt about that. But we need to think about that, that ecosystem. And I think the things that we've, we've talked about already today are, are around compatible and available infrastructure. I think consistent incentives um, to, you know, we, we've got to be careful not to be going up and down on, on, on some of the incentives. We need to give that, that confidence to, to the consumer in terms of purchase incentives. Um, and, and I think finally, as we, I'm sure we're here today, you know, clean and reliable energy. Um, uh, and and you know, we need to be thinking about that broader ecosystem to, to ensure that all of the parts start to, start to come together. Because what we haven't covered is also the manufacturing base. So we've spoken about it in some of the previous sectors, but investment or having a manufacturing base, because as an industry, we do have 800,000 people working in our industry. If you've got the manufacturing base, it needs to be an attractive place to, um, to manufacture. And you're trying to, you need a, a good market, so you need a market size so that we aren't exporting more vehicle. Or you've got a strong market to build. You need batteries. You've spoken about that in terms of supply of batteries. Um, and then you need to be competitive versus other countries in terms of why come manufacture here. And that's where government has a strong part to play in terms of working with um, OEMs or manufacturers to make it, because if you can then do that and make it an attractive place to work, you've got the supply chain that then can come, you've got the actual suppliers of the components for manufacturing, and there's a lot of positive ramifications, but that's a big statement that needs to be made by government in terms of supporting UK manufacturing when you're competing with other markets and other countries. Would you like to round us off? I, I'm not, not sure I can add much more to what everyone else has said. I think the one thing just to think is that for the automotive industry, the government has given us an end date of 2035. And not only an end date, but they've given us a glide path, the, the zero mandate. So we've got an end date and we've got a glide path to manage that. And in response to that, Mike talked about the massive investment that's, that manufacturers have put in to get there. What's kind of missing is that similar end dates, glide paths and plans for infrastructure, for clean energy, for everything, and also an absolute focus on, on that date around taxation, around fiscal policy, around investment. And it's the, the big plan is, it, it, so it kind of feels a bit one-sided at the minute, and that's kind of what I'd say. If, if I can just, just add to that, I would, you know, from next year or maybe 2024, all of us are gonna face a zero emission vehicle mandate. A minimum percentage of the cars we sell in this country have to be ZEVs. That must be matched by uh, a binding target rollout for uh, public charge points. We have to have that to fuel the other. You can't have a Z ZEV mandate for manufacturers and have no mandated mandates for charge points. Clear call for action. Fantastic, thank you. Um, we have a few minutes and I'd really like to open up to the audience. Um, could I ask, lots of hands going up already, fantastic. Um, if we could bring mics, let's go here. This was the first hand I saw. Um, if you could just uh, give your name, the company you're from, and if you're addressing the question to a particular panel member, please.
Thank you. Uh, Halil Badevi from Santander corporate uh, manufacturing team. As an engineer, I'm, I'm curious that we have this uh, range anxiety or issues with charging, charging points. I, I'm curious to find out, has the replaceable battery been considered where you, when you run a, out of battery, you can pull into a, a station, you click your, your battery out or part of it, I know it's a big thing and it's distributed all over the car, but is there a way of just putting one in so that you can at least get to your next destination and in that way you may not have to charge your own battery, you can, you can ch mass charge them in charging factories, you can pick one up. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm not an engineer, um, I can't tell you anything about the engineering of the car, but what I would say is that um, you know, our new EV6, you can charge from 10% to 80% in 18 minutes. I'm not sure I could change a battery in that time. So I think the charging uh, infrastructure that's required is, is being matched by investment by manufacturers in ultra-fast charging, and charging times are going to come down. Therefore, it's going to be, you know, drive into a, into a charging station, plug your car in, go and get your coffee, pay for it, come back and drive away. Uh, I think you, we're complicating it by changing battery parts. You know, none of us, other than the engineering community, are probably capable of changing a battery. I think engineers are very capable of designing something where you can just plug it in, pull it out, very easy. You don't need a charging points all over the place. But it was just an idea and a curios curiosity because this hasn't <laughs> been mentioned anywhere. It doesn't come up, so I just wondered. Thank you. Okay, over here on the second row, please. Good morning, Peter Campbell from the Financial Times. Uh, a sort of double-headed electric vehicle question, if I may. Um, we know that interest in EVs rises whenever fuel prices rise, so I'd be interested for the three OEMs who sell BEVs to see what the interest has been in the last four weeks compared to how it was before that. And also we know that prices that go into the batteries are rising because of materials that come out of Russia. Are you expecting to see a, a, a rise in EV prices in the prices that you pay for batteries are you going to pass that on in sticker prices or absorb that in lower margins? Thank you. Um, I'll pick up the first part, certainly. Um, interest has been staggering over the last few weeks. Um, I think there's lots of things impacting that level of interest, not just um, fuel price increases because electricity is going up as well. Um, but the whole uh, level of interest in EVs just continues to escalate. Um, I'm not really prepared to, to talk about future pricing strategies in an open forum. You can if you want. <laughs> I think, again, not wanting to talk about pricing, but during the fuel crisis last year, our interest and inquiry on EV went through the roof. So I think there, uh, uh, the economies of um, the cost of electricity and fuel may not be it. I think it was just a general... just overwhelming interest in the subject as people talk about it more publicly and it becomes as there are more in the road as well I think and we are you can see you, you see every time something like that happens you see the increase I think what is hard to predict at the moment is what's happening because of supply as well so I've seen definitely a, a genuine rise in the electric vehicle market so you will have had spikes but it, you can see it solidly over 20% in the UK, and you can see it across Europe for, for whatever reason. Um, but what, And then when you come to, you see people are making the move, but the concerns are as we've spoken. And then in terms of raw material price increases, I don't think it's just our industries that's seeing it. We've spoke, You can see it across everywhere, and for a variety of reasons. We've spoken about semiconductor shortages. We've spoken about um, everything that is contributing to a cost of living increase in this market and many others. And we then have choices as, as manufacturers or, or you know, sellers of services in terms of how you can manage to, to do that. And that's something you wouldn't talk openly about. But it is a challenge for our country. It's a challenge for our country and for Europe in terms of the rising cost of living and the rising prices. And um, that includes things that have happened as a result of Brexit. You know, that there are, are things we've seen in the labour market that are impacting it. So uh, there will be changes, but I think that's not specific to our industry. I think it's true of many industries and it's something that we will have to face as an industry. Um, and just before last question, um, just a quick reminder, I think um, obviously that's a huge kind of global issue, but as we said at the front, staying a little way away from the specific implications of Ukraine is, um, is really where we'd like to stick. 
So here on the yeah, right here by the microphone. One, two. Yep. Um, so my name is Paul Denny. I'm head of sustainability for Fasari and Graphene Limited. I started my EV journey five years ago with Nissan Leaf. I had a very short range. And to be honest with you, using the public charging network was an absolute nightmare because you never knew when you got to a charger whether an ice car would be parked in the way so you couldn't get on it, um, whether it was actually even working. So when I started with Vasari, and we have, a, we have a policy of offering all the senior managers Teslas, and the, the, the charging difference between the Tesla and the, the Nissan was, couldn't, couldn't have been more stark. I have never once, and I live in Scotland and I drive all over the UK, I've never once got to a Tesla charger and it didn't work. You plug it in, it charges, I get, I get a bill at the end of the month. It is the perfect system. Tesla, I think their dominance in the market has is, is, got a lot to do with the fact that they've got that amazing charging network. I've heard a lot of people, you know, panel members and others today, grumbling about the state of public charging. So my question is this, why don't you just get together and build your own charge network? You can't rely, like you've always done, on building cars and then allowing somebody else to provide petrol with electric. You need to build the electric vehicles, you need to build the, uh, the charging infrastructure, I think. And until you do that, I and a lot of other people I know are going to still be driving Teslas. So, <laughs> nice, I, I, nice way to wrap. No, Just but I think it's a valid challenge. I think it yeah. should be open sourced, and the, this is where you talk about the infrastructure um, companies getting together. So, are we experts in infrastructure? Not necessarily. The difference I would say with the product you've said is about affordability. So it's about making vehicles, electric vehicles, available to everybody because we've all had heard of experiences that, that you've spoken about and it's about battery range, it's about I can get a charger because actually they were specifically for those customers. But this is about making it available for everybody and affordable for everybody. So I agree that there should be a coming together of infrastructure, infra sorry, infrastructure providers, charger providers, and, and we see it on mainland Europe, you see it's more effective in terms of the apps that you can do. It's coming in the UK, but it's not been coming fast enough. So I think when you've got one app that gives all the charging availability and whether the charger is available and I'm, I can book it and I know I'm going to get it, I think that will make a massive difference in the way that you've described. More collaboration, always a nice note to end on. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for your questions. We're um, out of time. I, I could sit here all day and talk about this. I'm sure there's lots more um, unanswered questions in the room. Thanks, everyone.